Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Brand Design Masters podcast. I'm your host, Philip Van Dusen, and today I am here with Neil Schaefer. I'm really excited to have Neil on board. Neil is a social media strategy consultant, an author, a speaker, a podcaster. Neil works with companies in auditing their social media efforts and creates comprehensive social media strategies, as well as shares his wealth of knowledge with the world on the stage, on his podcast, through his books. Uh, he's got a podcast called the Maximize Your Social Influence Podcast. He's been a speaker at the Social Media Marketing World 2020. And he's the author of multiple books, uh, a number of books on LinkedIn, Maximizing LinkedIn, Maximizing Your Social, as well as the, his most recent book, The Age of Influence, published by HarperCollins. Um, which John Lee Dumas calls the manifesto of influencer marketing. So that's, that's a bit of an endorsement. He's also been named one of the top 10 uh, marketing thought leaders by CMO.com and in the top 50 social media power influencers by Forbes. Damn. So with that, I welcome Neil. Hey, Philip. Thank you for those kind words. I'm really excited to be here today. And let's, let's get to it. All right. So let's start with your book. You just published a new book, The Age of Influence. What made you want to write that book at this period of time? Well, as you were talking about my professional background over the last decade, I help companies normally as a consultant rather than an agency per se. Uh, a lot of the work I do now is what we would call a fractional or outsourced CMO type of job. So i put into positions, um, they're become their VP director of marketing part-time and try to figure out what are the big issues that they're dealing with. I noticed over the last two or three years, I wrote this book called Maximize Your Social back in 2013. And it's all about how to create a social media marketing strategy, how to measure social media marketing ROI. At that time, that was the question that the number one question I was getting asked by everybody. And over time, as the industry matures, the questions change as well. And I'd say back in 2017 and 18, there was this big spike in a lot of inquiries about influencer marketing and influencers. And that's really when I started to conceptualize and write the book. It got published in March of 2020. But as you know, with the way big publishers work, you know, the content was really written in 2019 before all this coronavirus pandemic stuff. Right. So I, I realized as I began doing research on the subject and interviewing people and looking at my own past work with clients, that there was this huge gap between what most people consider to be influencers and in influencer marketing and what the reality was and the potential really for any business and any brand. And the other interesting component of that is the very first time that this was the number one question I got asked was actually teaching a class at USC. It was an MBA class here in Los Angeles and I was a guest lecturing uh, for a professor. And not only was I getting asked by these MBA students about influencer marketing, but also how can I also become an influencer. I know that we have a lot of content creators listening to this. And that's been another interesting thing is that once we begin to realize how important influence, digital influence is today and how and why businesses need to tap into that, we can reverse engineer that process and see how we as people, as content creators can tap into the same phenomenon and actually become more influential. Not a Kim Kardashian, that's not what I'm talking about here. Uh, you talked about John Lee Dumas, right? That's an example of someone who built digital influence from a podcast like Pat Flynn. Others build their influence on LinkedIn. Others build it on Instagram. Others on Twitter, right? Others on YouTube. So uh, the content medium is not important. The social network is not important. It's showing up as a content creator consistently around certain subject and building a community from there. And that's really what defines digital influence today. So in the book about, it seems like about three quarters of the book is about influencers and how you can utilize influencers. So from a, you know, from a client perspective, essentially. Yes. Um, but then there's the tail end is that quarter, which is about becoming an influencer. And so why did you kind of marry those two things in the same book? It, it seems like to a certain extent, the audiences would be somewhat different, but I guess, as you were saying, it's very related. Yeah. So as I say, like in the preface of the book, this is not a book on how to become an influencer. There are other books out there that, that talk about that. This is really an extension of my consulting for businesses that realize that organic social media is dead. It's pay to play. 
you know, paid media is paid media. When you do Facebook ads as an advertisement, really the only way to incite the word of mouth that we as marketers hope to get on social media is through collaborating with other people and those other people are influencers. So one thing that I realized though is the more influence that your brand has, the easier it becomes to work with influencer. Every influencer would love to say they've worked with Coca-Cola versus some startup that no one's ever heard of, right? So the more influence that your business can yield, the more influencers will actually come to you mm. and want to work with you. So that's why every brand should become an influencer. I'm actually working, there's a CEO of a big real estate company. He bought my book and said, we need to do this here. All of our agents need to become influencers. And I'm actually working together with this company. And I said, look, you know, there are a bunch of real estate marketing podcasts that exist, but none of them are backed by big brands. You have tons of agents that could appear and give their advice and you could become the number one influential presence in this space. And therefore your business yields more influence. It's going to be a great recruiting tool, right? It's also a way to celebrate the wonderful agents that you already have. This is an example of a business tapping into this and yielding more influence. And then guess what? All those influencers that they've wanted to reach out to in the industry, they're going to knock on their door and ask to become on their, go, go on their podcast, right? It's sort of how it works, right? It really, the more influence you have, the more it attracts other influencers. And therefore, the better terms you're going to get when you negotiate with influencers, the better the chance that they're going to respond to you. And as an extension of that, right? And I talk about leveraging your employees as influencers. You know, the way that social algorithms social network algorithms work is they're, they're skewed towards people, right? It's really hard for businesses to gain the same sort of traction that people can gain. So at some point, especially if you're a solopreneur or, you know, small business owner, it's really celebrating the influence of you. And that might be, that might be the key to gaining more influence. It may not work as well for your business unless you have your big business with lots of resources like this real estate company. But if you're, if you're a smaller business, then tapping into you as an influencer may be the way to go to yield more influence so that more people want to work with you. It's, you know, it's just the way that we as human beings are wired and work. And it's just a concept that throughout there at the end for companies saying, well, you know, what's next? What else can I do? The following chapter to end the book is about the use of artificial intelligence technology and that how that's going to help, uh, you know, brands in the future as well. But yeah, that's really the, the message I wanted to send people. And, and by the way, you know, if you reverse engineer all this, you can figure out, you know, how to do all this as well. So that's sort of where I, where I leave it at. But I think it is a natural extension. And I do see more and more big businesses actually hiring influencers mm -hmm. to help them manage influencers as well as to create content. And a lot of companies that are now investing in what we call employee influencer programs are really fostering employees to become more influential, beginning with executives and then probably sales and marketing folks. And then just general folks as well, because there's a lot more what we call nano influencers out there um, in terms of people we know, like, and trust. So I think a lot of I, I, I couldn't write the book without bringing that up because it's a natural extension. But I think there's a lot before that, which is you need to understand that influencer marketing is not about these people you've never heard of with millions of followers and spending $10,000 for an Instagram post that just generates fake likes. That's, it's, it, it's what we talk about in the media, but there is some of that, but there's a bigger reality that I don't want businesses to miss out on. You touched on something that I definitely, I want to circle back to about influencers at, at the workplace, essentially. So or influencers who are, who are currently working in positions. Um, but I'm going to table that for just a second. I think a little bit what you were talking about was people want to do business with people, right? People don't want to do business with brands and influencers are people and they create, they bring a level of humanity to a impersonal brand or to a corporation. And I think to a certain extent from a marketing standpoint, that's really where all this is, is kind of housed in a way. One of the chapters that you had was about, um, influencer identification. So you called it an art and a science. So if you're a brand and you're looking for an influencer to represent you, talk a little bit about identifying the appropriate influencer for you. Because I think even if you are an influencer and content creator listening to this, you'd want to know kind of what do I need to manifest in order to be attractive apart from, you know, the numbers of my followers, et cetera. The number one thing today, businesses have gotten a lot smarter. They used to use all these tools and who's talking about this and that. The number one thing you can do today is actually talk about the brand that you want to work with. Show them that you're an actual user of their products and services, that you're an actual fan. 
tag them in your stories to begin a conversation. More and more businesses are saying, well, and I talk about this in my book. I talk about this because I'm not from the influencer marketing industry, right? I'm an outside consultant looking in. The way that the industry has sold itself is just pure number of followers, right? And you got the celebrity, the macro, the middle, the, you know, the micro, the nano. And I say, let's look at our sphere of influence. Let's look at people that already know, like, and trust us, beginning with our employees, our, our partners. And then we look at our customers and our followers or people that mention us in social media. So if you really want to work with a brand, you'll want to fall into one of those areas. And probably it'll be, unless you're a customer, it'll be a follower who, who you know, talks about the brand. Hopefully you are a customer. Um, because more and more businesses are saying, well, why work with someone that doesn't know my brand? And therefore, when they talk about us, it's not going to sound authentic. And a lot of people who do this for a lot of brands, it's like every other post is, has hashtag advertisement, hashtag sponsored. Now, there are some influencers that are, great, that are good enough content creators that can get away with that, right? But I think a lot of people look at that and it's, from a brand perspective, it's more convincing if you've already talked about the brand. It, it, it's a natural. You already know, you, you already have a way of talking about the brand that you've already introduced to your community. And therefore, there's not all this internal back and forth that needs to go back. Oh, what is your company about? What is your positioning? What is your branding? You know it because you're a user. And that's very, very attractive to businesses as they shift from working with celebrities to working with that nano influencer, which is between one to 10,000 followers. And there's also you know, some studies after I wrote the book, post COVID-19, that shows a lot of budget is definitely shifting to working with these smaller, more authentic people that already have some sort of brand affinity. So when you reverse engineer it, it's really simple. But if you were to be there talking about brand A today, brand B, you can't be a user of every brand. It's not natural. It's not human. We tend to like a brand and stick with it. We might once in a while, you know, when another brand comes out with a new feature, try it. But we're pretty much creatures of habit. So that's why to become a full-time salaried influencer, I don't think is the goal. It's how to use this maybe as a side hustle, maybe to gain access to free product or service, which happens a lot. A lot of businesses are more than happy. So, you know, it's funny when I'm thinking about using a new social media tool, because I blog a lot about it and I'm sort of considered an influence on the subject, I'll reach out to the tool company saying, hey, I'd love to try out your tool. Do you have any special trials for influencers, right? I think it's totally okay to do that. And when you become an influencer and a content creator, you begin to do more of that. And that I think is the bigger benefit than getting paid $25 to post something on, on, on your Instagram feed and, and potentially devalue your brand in doing so. So hopefully that advice makes sense. It totally makes sense. And, and uh, you know, to a certain extent, that's what I've been doing. I've, you know, I started to proselytize about particular tools that helped me build my influence, you know, helped me build my YouTube channel. You know, I was talking about TubeBuddy when I had 10,000 subscribers. I still talk about them when I have 200,000 subscribers. And they reached out to me and said, hey, we want to interview you when you come to social media marketing world. We you know, want to set up an affiliate agreement with you. And they came to me because I honestly loved their product and it helped me build my business. And I think that that level of passion and authenticity is what drives, you know, when, when you are an influencer, drives companies to you. And I get pitched all the time now from, you know, emails, companies that have no business talking to me just because I, I wouldn't align with their product or service anyway. But I thought one of the interesting things you said, and because we do have a lot of, you know, kind of beginning content creators listening to this, uh, entrepreneurs, creative professionals, well, you were talking about micro and nano influencers, the 10,000 follower um, kind of group of people. So I think that's a very interesting uh, thing that's kind of probably evolved in the last three to five years is that that level, that number of followers has gone down and down and down as the need for breadth in influencers representing a brand has increased. So you have an, uh, there, there are these little influencers, tiny influencers now who have opportunities to, you know, make revenue and, and do brand deals. Um, when they barely have a following at this point. Yeah. And you know what, Philip, here's the other way the influence works. I am literally working on my YouTube strategy. I'm a little late to the game, but I'm a, I'm a beginner when it comes to YouTube and I'm literally debating, do I go with TubeBuddy or do I go with vidIQ? You have just sold me on TubeBuddy. I trust you. If, if it has helped you build your, that one sentence sold me on TubeBuddy. Right. I was on a podcast yesterday with a gentleman who was CMO. Do you, have you heard of Wave Video? Mm-hmm. Daniel Glickman, CMO. 
he started their influencer program. I said, Daniel, I was on Facebook one day scrolling. I see Mari Smith, who was their brand ambassador, talking about Wave Video, and she had this special ridiculous plan for like an annual package. At, and, and I bought it without ever having used the tool. I bought it purely by seeing Mari Smith, who is very well respected for Facebook marketing, talk about it in her feed. This is how powerful mm. it can become. But it could be at any level, right? We're all influenced by different people. When I did a book giveaway for my book, I asked people, who, do you, who are your favorite Instagram influencers? Who are your favorite YouTube channels? It's all over the place. We're all influenced by different people. And that's where nano influencers are also influencing people, right? It may not be at the same scale, but I think people, you know, well, if I want to work with Philip, he has 200,000 subscribers. It's not going to be cheap. But on the other hand, there are people with a few thousand subscribers that I might be able to work with at, at more preferential terms. And I might be able to con convert them into becoming a brand advocate before they become a bigger influencer, right? And really that's what we want. We want people to talk about our brand you know, long after we work to get, we collaborate together on an interview at social media marketing world or what have you. And you're, you're a case in point. So um, I, I think that just by naturally doing what you do and really bringing your audience along on the journey and the journey when it involves working with other people or brands, mentioning that um, can be a very, very powerful way to send those social signals to those peoples, to those brands. And you may not get nothing from it now, but over time, as more and more brands realize this and they really want to work with people that are actually their customers that have an active footprint in social and they're a content creator, I think you're going to have more and more opportunities. So let's talk about your brand a little bit. You have, you know, you have a, a growing digital footprint and presence, you know, you're podcasting, you're, see, <laughs> you, have a, brand. you have, you have a map on it right now. Yes. You have a, you have a mind map of your brand expansion. I have one of those too. <laughs> um, because it gets very complex, right? It really does get complex. And you also have to make, you have to make decisions around what you're going to put your back into because it's mm -hmm. very, it's very difficult. There's so many platforms, so many places you can expend energy and time producing content. You have to be really, really planful about what you're spending your time doing and being very strategic about it. Too. So talk a little bit about developing your own, um, you know, that genesis of saying, I need to kind of develop my own individual presence, my own individual brand. And what were your steps in laying a groundwork and then expanding from there? Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I was a corporate employee for the first, you know, 17, 18 years of my career until I was in transition for the first time during the last recession, which is 12 years ago. And I, it was the first time I worked for a company where they actually let me go before I said sayonara to them. And it, what was really weird was they just hired me three and a half months earlier. And I'm a very, as hopefully you can tell, I'm a very passionate person. When I invest in something, I, I go, it's either all in or, or, or nothing. So I was actively investing my time and energy uh, to, to represent this company as a, as a sales professional, business development professional, marketing professional in Asia. And, um, you know, three and a half months after they hired me, they basically said, we're pulling the plug on international sales. So that to me was the wake up call that I needed to create something that no one could take away from me. Mm -hmm. And that was my personal brand. And that's what started me with a blog. And my blog was on LinkedIn because this is 2008 and uh, Twitter had just been announced at South by Southwest. Facebook was pretty much primarily for college students still. LinkedIn was the only place we could really go to network. And they had a wordpress.com app on LinkedIn. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to start a blog. <laughs> and I really wanted to start a blog as a networking vehicle, but I got really involved with LinkedIn, seen as a really powerful tool, started blogging about it. And my wife says, Neil, why don't you consider writing a book if you don't find a job? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to find a job. I don't want to be an author. But as 2009 was a very, very difficult time in, in our country's history. And, and it was, I, I didn't find what I was looking for. And I, I had to reinvent myself because the first 15 years of my career were in Asia. because I speak Japanese and Chinese and, and I wanted to be, you know, the, the VP of Asia sales but people were not going to hire those sorts of people in the United States. They wanted to hire them on the ground. I'd moved back to the United States when mm. we were growing our family. So I had to reinvent myself. And I ended up writing a book in 2009 about LinkedIn, which led to speaking opportunities, which then helped me launch my consultancy in January 2010. And I haven't looked back. The blog is what gave me authority. And I self-published my first book back in 2009 before it became as popular as it is today. So it was, a, it was a supply and demand. Um, I was out there with the content. There weren't that many content creators. Same thing mm -hmm. with my blog. I got a lot of 
I got a lot of traction really, really quickly. So the blog, and because I deal a lot with, you know, more B2B types of subjects, which are very driven by content, um, that has really been the central force of what I do. I've made the mistake of rebranding my blog. So doing a lot of 301 redirects from this wordpress.com, you know, blog to the windmill networking, to the maximize your social, to maximize. And then I finally say, you know what? My name is my best brand. It's neilschafer.com going forward. And that's where I'm at now. But I sort of lost some, some uh, brand equity with Google along the way that I'm trying to regain now. But, you know, podcasting is really, for me, the second area that I've focused on. So when we think about generating influence, there's four content mediums. There's photography, there's video, there's text, there's audio. Now we can go even more granular and talk about, you know, stories and TikTok dances. I don't, I don't want to go that far, but basically, you know, if you're a content creator, one of these four things you're probably doing the most of, you're the most passionate about, you're the most expert in because I was an author, the blog was the natural, but now, uh, you know, I do a lot of speaking. So the podcast for me is a natural because I speak a lot. And I know a lot of people in the industry. I've, I've spoken at social media marketing world every year since its inception. I know a lot of the other speakers, right? I, I have a lot of great people that I could bring on for interviews as well. And the podcast, when I started it back in 2013, I wasn't a podcast consumer myself. I was a, I was a fake in all, in all honesty, right? I came at it from a content marketing initiative rather than really understanding what podcast listeners listen to in a podcast. So in Q4 of 2019, I just completely redid my approach. I started to become an active consumer. And I think my podcast has really grown since then. And I'm more passionate about it. I listen to podcasts now. I have 10 podcasts every week I'm listening to when I'm in my car. Um, so for me, where do I go from here? Well, once we understand the way that SEO works, we understand that guest blogging is really important. And I've, I've made a, this mind map I started writing yesterday because I'm making a strategic decision to not only am I going to blog on my own blog once a week, but I'm also going to blog on someone else's blog once a week to expand my footprint digitally. I am also going to be starting a second podcast. One of my good friends is also a professor of marketing at universities, and she also just wrote a book on influencer marketing. So we're going to start a podcast all about influence, uh, which I'm really excited about. So that's the way I extend my, my brand there. And then video for me is the final frontier. And I really want to start because I, I could be doing it. I, I could be just like, you may repurpose this video into videos. I could be doing the same thing. And I've spent a lot of time really researching other channels and what, you know, why people use YouTube, what are they looking for in that YouTube experience? So I'm just now putting together that keyword strategy, which is why I was wanted to use that TubeBuddy or VidIQ. <laughs> and I'll go with TubeBuddy to begin to create that editorial calendar that hopefully in Q4 I'll be up. Because I think today it's really hard to get seen with blogs. You compete with big companies there's very few, if any big companies that do a podcast and do it right, there's also very few big companies that do a, video, a YouTube channel and do it right as well. They take a content marketing approach to this. They post videos every now and then. It's not a channel approach. It's, it's things that look very corporate. They don't look very authentic. You know what I mean? So if I'm a content creator today, and this is what I tell all my clients, and Instagram, by the way, is great. TikTok is great, but it's ephemeral. It's here today, gone tomorrow. In fact, you know, I'd say the lifetime of an Instagram post used to be about 24 hours. I'm seeing that now go down to 18 hours, go down to 12 hours. Oh, yeah. Right. So I believe, and it's not, it's, it's searchable, but not in the same way that a YouTube search engine works or a podcast search engine works. So I'm doubling down on podcast and on, on video. And if I were you and if, if I was looking for a new way to create, and I think YouTube podcast by far, it's supply demand. There's too few supply. I even think on YouTube, there's so many people that have done it uh, haphazardly. They've had success or they haven't been strategic. They, I, I think there's plenty of opportunity on YouTube. When I go to YouTube and I see all these videos, that, you know, I can do better than that. That's when I know it's time for me to do YouTube. So hopefully that makes sense. And I think it's an easy way. You start with your own channel. And then once you feel comfortable and you've built up the influence, it, here's the thing, Philip, that I didn't talk about a lot in the book, but once you have influence, you need to yield influence. The reason is there's always other influencers that are trying to capture the attention of your audience. Mm -hmm. So you always need to be able to yield it. So for me, starting a second podcast, doing the guest blogging, and obviously doing the YouTube is my way of yielding and converting all these other audiences now to hopefully generating uh, you know, uh, subscriptions on my YouTube channel or for my own podcast by being on, by collaborating with someone on a second podcast. So that's that's an that's a, you know, intermediate to advanced step. But if you feel like yourself, you're already at 200,000 subscribers, where do you take that next, right? 
And th- those are the areas that I'd be looking into. I've just been scribbling notes frantically. There's like seven major topics out of what you were just talking about that I want to talk about. We can make, we, we might have to make this a, a, a double show. Um, one of the things that you were talking about that I, th- I think is really important and it actually speaks to the, the subject that I wanted to loop back to, which was influencers with a job. You had talked about um, developing your personal brand as a level of job insurance or, some, or building you know, some equity in something that you own that no employer could take away from you. I totally understand that. I did the same thing. I came out of a 25 plus year career in big corporate, big agency and had no personal brand built for myself, had a lot of credibility, but I didn't have any of my own real estate or infrastructure or brand ecosystem at all and built that from scratch. Um, And so I'm always advocating for people who are currently employed to start building some sort of presence for themselves, a website, social following, some modicum of content to establish a foothold. So if that rug is pulled out from under them by a COVID or by a, you know, a economic downturn or whatever is going to ha- befalls our country very majorly, you know, seemingly every five years, um, you're somewhat ready for it. Um, and so talk a little bit about that, you know, becoming an influencer, the value of becoming an influencer while you're actually still employed. Yeah, it's, this is something, man, my very first book back in 2009, I talked about this. I talked about, you know, at the time it was only LinkedIn, but I'd say becoming a content creator, it's sort of like career insurance, right? Um, having a robust LinkedIn profile is a no brainer. That's career insurance, but also, you know, by becoming a content creator, in the book, I talk about this 99-1 rule. This is a concept created back in, I think, 2005 or so. Looking at internet users, that 90% of internet users are lurkers, 9% are engagers. They comment, they post reviews on Yelp and Amazon. Only 1% are true content creators. Mm-hmm. And I believe that that model can be replicated on any given social media network as well. Yes, Instagram has a billion users. How many people post consistently on Instagram week in and week out? it's probably 1%. It's probably 10 million. And maybe of those billion, there's another 90 million that actively engage and post less frequently. But a lot of people are just lurkers. They don't post themselves, right? Uh, If they do post, maybe they just post a story. It's not on their feed. So if you go to their profile, it looks like they haven't posted in a year, but then you notice they have a story. I I see a lot of this on Instagram. So they're not really part. So when you become a content creator, you become a one percenter. And as brands look to collaborate more and more with people, they obviously do searches. You know, who is talking about us? Who's talking about this subject? And when you as a content creator come up, that's just immediate credibility. Could you be hired because of the fact that you're an influencer in your industry? Absolutely. If I was, if I worked at a company, I would want to go all out to promote that company, to become an internal brand ambassador for that company because that is helping me yield influence. It's helping me build relationships and credibility and that can convert into my next job or it can convert into a side hustle or, or anything else I want it to. So I think that at the end of the day, you know, most jobs, we talk about the hidden networking, the, the, the hidden opportunities. Most jobs are people you get to know and they're like, hey, I'd like to hire you, right? It's not, there, there was no formal process. Um, they had an opening which they didn't advertise and once they found the talent, because before COVID, we know that, uh, you know, we had extreme talent shortage in our country and our unemployment rate at the lowest it's been in a while. I believe we're going to get back to that. And you want to be known uh, for someone, you know, it, it, it's your way of differentiating yourself. You know, we talk about branding and I'm not a brand expert by any means, but I think branding is about showcasing your strengths and differentiating yourself. And there's no better, better way to do that than to put a digital stamp on the internet and showcase who you are and what you do. So I, I think that it, it's a no brainer. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. You're, you're sort of digging your well before you're thirsty. You're paying it forward to all the other people, you know, consider yourself a virtual mentor to people that are just starting out. There's so many good things about it. It does require an investment of time, but if you were to take, you know, every Friday late afternoon, take 15 minutes or 30 minutes, create one piece of content, you know, put it out there and start to build something. I just think it has so many benefits. And I, I use, Philip, I don't know about you, but I use social media as almost like an experimental test bed. I experiment with ideas. I'll say stuff to see what people say. I'll test market stuff. This age of influence was a test market 
that I put on a Kickstarter like platform that ended up selling. So I was like, okay, I better write the book now because people actually want it. <laughs> um, so you can actually use social media in that way of, of getting feedback from people for even your work without saying, you know, what project you're working on, what have you. So there's just so many ways of using it and so much value. And when you begin to create that content and build that influence, that's where I think the magic happens. But even before that, as someone that engages uh, and, and builds, a, 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 you know, builds friendships and builds relationships, it can be extremely enriching uh, to one's career. Yeah, I think that's a very important point as building your building your personal brand presence while you're employed because you may very well become unemployed by no fault of your own a company restructuring or something you know they come in and clean the house some new executive and then you have some sort of a present that you can be found by the people who are looking to fill that position at another company when there isn't a listing being made because you're right that's where a lot of jobs are filled it's through your network, through people that you know, through referrals. Um, one of the things that you were mentioning when you were talking about starting to get into YouTube, which I think is really important for us to highlight, which is the importance of search as opposed to ephemeral content. And I found that Instagram content, particularly stories, lots of Twitter, you know, the lifetime, the lifespan of a tweet is like 15 seconds. Yeah. Um, putting your back into content that lives somewhere for a while, like, you know, posting an article on Medium or posting an article on LinkedIn, something that's going to get indexed by Google and start showing up in search. One of the things that I experienced, and this is a good reason why you're going into YouTube, Neil, is because, you know, YouTube is owned by Google. And Google indexes YouTube content with a high level of seniority when returning search results. And within my first two years, I did a fairly popular video on um, what does a creative director do? Hmm. And when you searched what is a creative director on Google, my YouTube video showed up as the first result. And if you search the words creative director on Google Images, my video thumbnail was the first thing that showed up. And that just kind of blew my mind, number one, because it was my thumbnail and then 50 pictures of black and white, super famous creative directors. And so paying attention to how those social aspects are linked, I think is critical. One question I have for you about LinkedIn, a lot of creative professionals who listen to my content and, and follow what I do are not utilizing LinkedIn to its full potential. I am always proselytizing about the fact that it's an incredibly unutilized platform for visual content because it can stop that scroll, that LinkedIn scroll, which is sometimes very dry or, you know, business articles, et cetera. What do you, what do you think about that in terms of LinkedIn's, you know, um, uh, feed as being a, a vehicle for creative professionals? Absolutely. I, I just did a one hour webinar this morning, all about LinkedIn. It was for sales professionals in the insurance industry. And one of the things I talked about was the visual, right? So it begins with people do searches and they may be looking for a creative director. They may be looking for a graphic designer, whatever it is, right? They do a search, you know, do you show up in the search? How do you show up? But once they get to your profile, LinkedIn is really focusing on the visual. So the very top is this branded uh, background image and LinkedIn as a default that you'll want to swap out because you can use that to really get your branding off to a really great start in the platform, really differentiate from all the other people that haven't been customizing that image. And if, if you're a creative person that that's, I mean, that's in your wheelhouse, you, you know how to do it and how to do it best. Then obviously you have your professional photo. And what's really interesting, what happens after that, you have your professional headline. This is really important. You know, how do you help people? How do you help businesses? And then you have an about, paragraph, which is your summary. But then right below that, what LinkedIn has started doing is, is offering the ability to feature posts. So it is, it is a visual thing. I showed uh, an example today of an insurance salesperson who basically created a featured post, which is a link back to their website. So it had their photo, right? But when you clicked on the photo, it went directly to the website. So this is a no brainer. If you have a, you know, a portfolio page somewhere, DeviantArt, or I don't know, that's just a no-brainer to have that visually is going to catch the eye. And when we go into how the news feed works on LinkedIn, it's like any other network, right? What gets the most engagement? Video. What's the second most engagement? 
photo, right? So just like your Facebook or anywhere else, the visual is really important. And the visual can take up a lot of real estate. I think the LinkedIn feed, a lot of times, even on a desktop, you only see one or two posts at a time if they have visuals. So you really have a chance to make a splash. And LinkedIn also has a supply and demand problem. There's not enough supply of content on LinkedIn. The 9091 rule, uh, there's way few people that publish content on LinkedIn. So this is another opportunity. Those of us who do this know that we're getting a lot of impressions. I'd say LinkedIn might even be second to Instagram in terms of the number of impressions your content will get when you publish it on LinkedIn. And I showed today an example of a video I did. It was like a three minute video, right? It got like, you know, a thousand views. But what's incredible is like the total amount of time people spent watching that video was, I don't know, a combined like 10 hours. And it was a video I put out like a month ago. That's 10 hours of time that people are investing with me on LinkedIn. And a lot of times these people aren't even in my network. They're, they're friends of, of people in my network. So yes, LinkedIn is, is a critical piece. As a professional, it should have special importance to you. But as a creative professional, there are things you can do to, to your advantage that you should be doing because I think it's going to help you gain even greater traction than those of us who aren't creatives. There's something that I've been uh, suggesting a lot of people do, the, the in introduction of carousels, which are basically, you know, you can, they're PDFs that you post, but you can progress through the slides and there's no page limit. So essentially you can post a PDF of your portfolio and people can page through it and you're not posting 50 JPEGs on one post. You're just posting a PDF of your slideshow. And it's absolutely amazing that more people aren't utilizing that because it's an incredible tool and not only can you put your work on there, but you can, you know, have messaging on there about your brand or just something you want to promote or whatever, or point of view on some sort of content. One of the things that um, is important that I, I want you to talk about a little bit was what can you do to get your, your LinkedIn posts that are in that feed seen by a broader range of people than just your connections? And one of the things I talk about a lot are the use of hashtags because people will follow hashtags and then your work will show up in that feed of hashtags. Uh, is that the best way of doing it or are there other methods? So hashtags are, uh, they are now being supported by LinkedIn. I think the recommendation is between, you know, one to five hashtags per post. You, you can still gain visibility without it. I think in all honesty, the number one way I believe to get seen by people outside of your network is people in your network engaging with the content. So we know the way the Instagram algorithm works, right? Chances are that we have so many followers that, that are active that it rarely gets outside of those people unless they're following a hashtag or we show up in the, on the discover page, right? But with LinkedIn, there are so few people that log in on a daily basis. LinkedIn is always trying to serve up content because there's a lack of supply of that as well. So at some point, unless you have a lot of connections, and even if you do have a lot of connections like I do, it wants to serve up engaging content. So when I go through my feed, and this is a challenge everybody listening or perhaps watching, I want you to do, go into your LinkedIn feed and see how much of the content actually came from people in your network and how much of the content was exposed because someone in your not network liked it or mm -hmm. commented on it. And you're going to see more than any other network right now. And Facebook used to be this way, but those days are long gone. I see a lot of content that's been liked or commented by someone in my network. And therefore, the content creator is a second degree network. So you need to build a community of connections that are actual active LinkedIn users and consumers of content. And those are the people that are, that is how your, your content, when they engage with it, that's going to be, I believe, your best opportunity more than, I mean, you can use hashtags, but I believe that's your best opportunity to really be seen. So if you've been on LinkedIn for 10 years, like I have, I go through and prune my contacts. I mean, I, back in 2008, I was connecting with recruiters that are completely irrelevant to what I do today. I'm disconnecting with them, right? Because with the way that algorithms work, it's lost. It's going out to people that are never going to engage with the content. Mm. So you really want to align your connections with active LinkedIn users. Don't just connect with someone because LinkedIn says they're in your contact database. They may not be active users. And on any public profile, this is one of the things that I offered on the webinar today. I did an audit of all these salespeople's profiles. You can actually go into someone's profile and see their activity. You can actually see if they've not only published on LinkedIn in the last 30 days or, or, or forever, but, you, but if they've engaged with other posts. So I'm not saying you want to overly pick and choose people, 
but it does give you the ability to see who are more active than others should you do the homework. Mm. And you can reach out. You know, it's not just about the people that you already know. It's about, you know, mutual friends and connections. It's maybe about other bloggers, other creators that you want to network with, people that you have a lot of mutual connections that, you know, it, it's a virtual networking event, right? 24-7. So once you start doing that and you find people that are active on LinkedIn, where there's some, you know, commonality and they're already engaged with a lot of content, that's where I think a lot of things can happen. Now, I do want to say, I'm not going to recommend you do this. The same reason why I'm recommending you don't do things that are called Instagram pods. Some of you listening to this may know what they are. Some may not know what they are. They're inauthentic ways of people basically commenting and engaging on these other content. The pods are now alive and well on LinkedIn as well. And I know a lot of people have been doing this and it, it is effective. It does dupe the algorithm. I don't do it. I think it's, I'd rather spend that time creating content and developing real relationships rather than trying to dupe the algorithm. But it, it is something growing. It'll be interesting to see what LinkedIn does, but it just goes to show you how the supply demand that once you start creating content and you start to get some engagements, which is what a pod does, it really can expand to a bigger and bigger network. So a lot, of, a lot of folks who listen to this are, some are kind of just coming up in their careers or are still developing in their careers and have had mentors or influencers in their careers. Can you talk a little bit about people in your life or your professional career who have influenced you in terms of what you're focused on, what you're passionate about, anything that's, that was a critical juncture for you? Yeah, you know, early on in my career, um... I'd, I'd go to two points early on in my career. It was my third year working. Uh, I was in overseas sales at a Japanese semiconductor company and their headquarters was in beautiful Kyoto, Japan. And uh, that year, all of us that were in our second or third year, there was a Japanese term called Chukei Shine, sort of like you're, you're not a beginner employee right now. You're entering the intermediate stages. We had this, you know, we have annual training. The training that year was on something called the Deming Circle. And uh, Professor Edwards Deming, for I didn't know at the time, he was an American professor. He's considered the godfather of quality control. He's, his teachings influenced the Toyotas and the Sonys to become the, the manufacturing prowesses that, that they are today. And in that training, we learned of something called the Deming Circle or the Deming Cycle, which is also called the PDCA Cycle. And it's that whatever work you do, he, Professor Deming created this based on managing experiments. But Basically, what you do when you manage an experiment is you plan the experiment. You do the experiment according to how you planned out how you think you're going to be successful with it. You check how you did, and then you act upon your findings, and you further optimize it in this never-ending circle of Kaizen. So when I created my first social media marketing strategy in January 2010, there were no frameworks out there for me to work off of, but I connected the dots in sort of Steve Jobs fashion and realized that that same way of managing experiments can be applied to social media because it is an experiment. It's a never ending, changing landscape. And we never know how people will react unless we do the experiment. So that's why my company is called PDCA Social. It's why I talk about the Deming Circle in, in every book that I've written. So that's definitely been one influence. But the other influence from a, a business perspective is a gentleman named Kurt Shacker. Not even sure where he works these days, but when I was working at my next employer, which was an American software company that ended up being bought out by Intel, they were called Wind River. Um, Kurt Shacker was VP of business development. And at our annual corporate meeting in Alameda, California, he was talking about a strategy for the next year. And he was telling everybody, you know, a strategy, what's important about a strategy isn't just the strategy itself. What's more important or even most important is what we don't do as part of the strategy. And so many people try to do so many things. First, think about what is era, what do we not need to do? And that's been a very, very powerful concept that I continue to use. Um, I'm a big fan of, um, uh, you know, tight, uh, you know, organization and, you know, Marie Kondo, right? Um, and I'm actually organizing my CD collection with the same sort of concept. Do I get joy from listening to this music or not today? <laughs> <laughs> you know, 30 years ago, I might have, but not today. Um, but I'm a big fan of, you know, things that we don't need to strategically do. We need to either not do them or downgrade them in what we do. So mindlessly posting through your Instagram feed is not strategy, right? Posting, you know, e ephemeral content is not strategy. Posting content to be seen by the search engine 
in a way that gives us our best chance to be seen by the search engine, that strategy. So those are two things that I can share with you that have definitely influenced me. Um, you know, and these are things I heard back in, uh, these both come from the 90s, so I guess they're still influencing me today. <laughs> so that was a really great point that you made in terms of deciding what not to do. And I've been struggling with that as my range of content platforms has expanded. And uh, because you want to be everywhere, you want to do everything. Um, talk a little bit about what is the decision-making criteria for you in terms of where you're putting your energy. And if you are sunsetting your energy somewhere else, um, why is that happening? And is that happening to you right now? Or are you just, because you're obviously in a ton of places. I mean, you know, your introduction is obvious and that was only a third of your about me page on your website. <laughs> well, you start with one and you do it well. And once you do it well and you want to expand your influence, that's when you think of others. So for me, I've been blogging since 2008. I've gone through a series of iterations, which is um, somewhat minimize the potential influence I could have had if I had the same domain name through all those years, right? Um, so I've also blogged about things that are irrelevant today, like Google Plus or StumbleUpon or Ello, for those of us that remember that creative network. Uh, Ello. <laughs> I even have a podcast episode about Ello, right? Um, which you might want to listen to just for a laugh. But, um, but, but that's the thing is that what's happened over time, for me, the trigger point is, I see people come out of nowhere and begin to yield influence. A lot of people talk about them. A lot of people link to their content. So my whole guest post strategy going forward is because I've analyzed how a few people in my industry have come out of nowhere and now they yield more influence than I do, at least an, mm -hmm. from an SEO perspective. Mm -hmm. So that's driven me to say, why are, you know, I see people getting five, 10 times more traffic than I'm getting based on what the tools tell me their estimated traffic is. That's what's fueling me to say, okay, I've only reached a 10th of my potential with my current blog. I need to do more. And the strategy that I plan to use, I, I consider for, for those of us that want to go into blogging, you know, one third of it is keyword research, just like you do for YouTube videos. It is critical. Too many people post blogs without that research and they end up blogging about things that they think people are interested in, but nobody ever searches for. Mm -hmm. Complete waste. I did that for eight years. Don't do that. The second part of blogging, if I was to divide into thirds, is the actual content creation, creating stellar content. And the third part is actually getting people to link to that content. Because the biggest influencer of them all is Google. And the way that we show Google we have influence is when people from out, outside of our own sphere, when, when everybody in the internet links to us, that's telling Google that we're influential and they serve us higher and higher in the search results, right? So that's sort of, you know, where I got from with, with there, the, the, you know, so, and I started doing this because now I, for the first time in my career, I have a three month pipeline of weekly content already ready to publish. So when you get to that point, right, where, it, you know, you got the machinery in place, you got the time, you got the system and you're consistently publishing that content and you have a three month pipeline, I think it's okay to look for, if you have a reason, a trigger like I did to go to the next stage. The podcast is, I don't have a three month pipeline I'm still sort of week to week with the exception. I do a lot of solo episodes and I like to be sort of in the time. I don't want to like pre-record something, you know, a year ago and publish it today when it's completely irrelevant. So, um, but I, but there is someone that I'm working with, like I said, and I think we can create a compelling podcast together. And I realized that I know how to do it really easily and it doesn't have to eat up a lot of my time. And, you know, they also have some resources in terms of, you know, creating creatives. And, and so I, I think it's a very, very time efficient way of, of, you know, expanding my podcast uh, and expanding my listeners. And, you know, before that, what I was doing and what I'm doing here today with you, Philip, is also guesting on a lot of podcasts as well to expand my audience. So the YouTube is just the realization that that's the final frontier. And it, it's always been the final frontier. It's always been on my annual strategy, but I've always said, you know what, I really need to get my own house in order first. And let's start with the blog and then the podcast. As I begin to get more consistent and feel like I have the pipeline that's where I start to look more and more at YouTube. The tools have gotten better with YouTube. Um, and, you know, more and more people with, with work from home are, are, are reading it. Uh, Google obviously prefers it, it seems, more and more. I have a lot of blog content where I could actually embed YouTube videos in. I have a big social footprint, so I believe I can get those subscribers going. So that's really my thought process. I mean, I do this for a living. So I also need to showcase to my clients that I do this and I have a track record. For content creatives, you don't have to do this, right? Pick one, 
do it really well. But if you want to know, and if you have a product or service to sell, obviously you want to expand your audience. That might be the trigger point for you, but you don't, you can do one and do really, really well. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, Pat Flynn podcasted for several years before, you know, he started doing other things and, and, and John Lee Dumas as well. And now, you know, they have a blog, they have YouTube, they have everything else. So, but they began once they yielded the influence on one platform and they also had products and services to sell, which they could sell cross platform. So, um, it's an evolution. Don't, you don't need to be like Gary Vaynerchuk. He has a staff of like 18 content creators that work for him. Impossible. He's got an agency uh, of 80 people who work for him. <laughs> you know, exactly. <laughs> I, yeah. heard that eight, I heard his dedicated team for his content were 18. I believe I, it. I, yeah, yeah, I believe it. So I know, don't look over your shoulder. Stick to what's helped me is just, I'm here to serve my community. And I don't care what everybody else is doing. I don't care how many followers they have. You know, all it takes is one person to read my book and hire me. And in the first month, I'm making about as much as I made from my, you know, from my signing bonus with, with one of the biggest book publishers in the world. So that's the way you need to think about this. It's not about the quantity. It's about the quality. And really, if you keep serving your community, you will build influence. What people fail to do at some point is they, they get off the strategy, right? Or they start talking about things or creating content that's irrelevant to the community they've already developed or they do too much advertising, right? Um, or so, they spread yeah. themselves too thin, like you said, you know, yeah. they try to be too many places at the beginning. And, you know, like you said, Pat Flynn, very deep on podcasting till he had a massive audience before he went to you, YouTube. I put my back entirely into YouTube before I did podcasting because I knew that I could transport my audience and, and promote my podcast on my YouTube channel and, yeah. and get a very quick audience over on podcasting rather than it growing organically. So leveraging and really focusing in strategically on a single platform at the beginning, I think is one of those key, key messages that you're putting out there and very, very smart. Absolutely. Um, okay. This, uh, this has been absolutely amazing, Neil. You have dropped so much value. It's incredible. I always end my podcast by asking all of my guests one simple question. And it's a deep question, but it is, do you have a personal manifesto or a mantra that you try to live your life by? Well, I'm going to give you two. I mean, first of all, I try to live a life of no regrets. So whatever I did in the past is gone. As my, my wife my, my now wife, when we were dating and, um, you know, I was coming out of a, a very, very long relationship. Uh, I, I was never married before, but it was, it was a long relationship. And, um, I, you know, I said, I feel really weird talking to you about this. And, and she goes, no, we're, you know, we're, we're all built from our past. All of those people that you used to date are part of, they made you who you are today and we should be thankful for them. Mm. And um, those were really wise words uh, for, for my now wife, but it just, it, it's a reminder that there's no regrets in life. We did everything at the time for a reason and we move on and we learn and we build from that. So the other one, um, it's something that it's funny because I forgot what it was. There was some social network that said, you know, leave a quote, what, you know, what's your favorite quote? And the quote that he used then is really important now. I think it's attributed to Woody Allen. I don't know if that's like the politically correct person to quote, but um, the quote is 80% of success is showing up. And I think vis-a-vis -vis social media and vis-a-vis -vis influence, you know, people talk about, you need to consistently publish. You don't need to consistently publish, but when you do consistently publish, the algorithm always has fresh content to give people. And that's why people who publish YouTube weekly and Instagram daily, tend to build those larger audiences because there's consistency and where everybody else is only posting once a month or once a week or, you know, once every year, they lose all of the opportunities that you get. That's how it works. So you got to show up. And when you show up, that's the secret to success. So uh, I think I started using that quote back in like 2008 and I still use it today because it's, it's so true about the digital world we live in. You're, you're either showing up or you're not. That's absolutely right. So Neil, where can people find you? Well, my name is Neil Schaefer and that's my social handle. It's also neilschaefer.com. I am the real Neil. So please avoid the uh, Starbucks barista fail of spelling Neil in any creative way you can think of like K-N-I-E-L. And <laughs> uh, boy, I can tell you. Um, so it's the real Neil, N-E-A-L. And there's a few Schaefers of us out there in sales and marketing. My last name is spelled S-C-H-A-F-F-E-R. Uh, my book is called The Age of Influence. It's uh, available wherever fine books are sold. And my podcast is called the Maximize Your Social Influence Podcast. 
Awesome. Well, thank you, Neil, for making time for us today and the Brand Design Masters podcast. I really appreciate it. And I hope you'll come back and join us some other time. I, it's really been an honor to be here. And I'm a big fan and supporter of content creators. And I really hope that everybody takes Philip's advice and, and hopefully my advice in this podcast to heart. And hopefully we'll be able to six months to a year from now, talk about all the great case studies of people that have built successfully built influence on these platforms. Awesome. Absolutely. Wholeheartedly agree. Thanks a lot. Thanks.